Hi everyone, welcome to the Dargon Gaming Squad. Today we're doing a GM panel on teaching people how to play RPGs. And Hi everyone, welcome to the Dargon Gaming Squad. Today we're doing a GM oh, panel okay. on teaching people how to play RPGs. And Hi everyone, welcome to the Dargon Gaming Squad. Today we're doing a How do I fix that? Okay. Mute, mute, mute the YouTube. Right, okay. All right, that was good. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Anyway, we are uh, doing a panel today on um, teaching people how to play RPGs, and we really thank you if you've joined us. And um, so I'm going to let my co hosts um, introduce themselves, starting with uh, Jeff. Yes, hello, everybody. I'm Jeff. Um, I run a YouTube channel. It's called Encounter Balance, uh, where I run mostly just live plays. Every once in a while, I'll put like a separate video and stuff up there. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, being a part of it. Um, discussions like this are always interesting to me, so I'm looking forward to it. Mary? Hello, I'm Mary Chris, and I do art stuff, I do music stuff, and you can uh, catch me on YouTube at Mary Chris, and on Facebook at Mary Kay Art, so, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. So, um, yeah, so I thought, uh, so this was originally scheduled to be part of the Brigade Con event, and when it got canceled, I really felt like I didn't want to let this slide. So uh, we're doing it anyway. I have posted a link in the chat. I hope I did it successfully um, in the YouTube chat, that is, uh, to Child's Play Charity. Um, that event is usually done to support that charity. And so if you uh, feel like, uh, if you feel moved to do so, it'd be great uh, if you donated today. And otherwise, we hope you enjoy um, this panel. So, without further ado, um, so I guess the first thing um, is that I kind of wondered is like when it comes to teaching people who are absolutely brand new to the game, you know, what what approach do you have? Is there something you do different than you do with um, players that have experience? Just throw them to the wolves. Just get them in. Boom. Full campaign? No, not really. Um, I like that was a, sort of how my experience went when I first got into D&D. Was um, just this: we're gonna do a campaign, and here's your character, and it's just a little alienating, just because um, not really sure what to do or how to act. Because my experience before was just playing like. RPG kind of video games and so things are very clear-cut versus having your full own choice of how would your character react in this situation um, and um, so it just took people just really kind of opening up the spot and being like well what would you do and uh, and if I was lost like kind of even giving some suggestions like would they be interested in that? Um, we know that they have this as like one of their passions, so maybe they would handle in this kind of direction and kind of got me thinking like, okay, and getting into the head of my character versus just going, well, clearly someone knows something that my character would do with it instead of me. Like, where's the select A, select B? So I'd say just bring them in in just something simple um, where they can get a feel for sandboxing in a way just doesn't matter what your choice make just make a choice have fun with it yeah and i'd say like focus like when i bring in like completely new players i try to focus more on like what the players want to do rather than like like what the game is so little bit of the rules like you know you roll a d20 and then you'll maybe add something to it and then that'll be how you decide like assuming we're talking D&D &D, other systems obviously that'll differ but instead of saying like okay which of your character options like which spell do you want to cast which abilities you want to use just asking them like step away from their character sheet and just say like 
what do you want your character to do in this situation and let them come up with whatever they want to. Um, something I see that can happen sometimes, which is really unfortunate, is like if you bring them direct, if you direct them towards their character sheet too soon, they kind of start to lock in their character abilities as like their options. Like as if it was like an RPG, like they're playing Final Fantasy. They can pick attack or they can pick block or they can pick cast this spell. And yeah, it totally kind of takes yeah. them out. It <laughs> takes them out of that mindset of like that creative mindset. Well, yeah, well, you could attack, you could block, you could cast a spell, but you could also do anything else. You can try to push the rock off the cliff and have it hit somebody. You can have them try to negotiate with it instead of fighting. And it's like, that's kind of my main thing that I try to do is just instead of looking at the mechanics, use the mechanics, don't ignore the mechanics, but have them come afterwards. So say, hey, what do you want to do? I want to try to talk to them. Okay, well, what do you say? I say this, this, and this. Okay, so now we have a skill that we can use here, your persuasion. So roll a d20 and we'll add that. And kind of put that as the secondary focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember it was definitely roll your dice first and then we'll discuss if you're successful or not. Um, and I, I like, uh, and um, I think it was when I started doing like online gaming that um, I started getting in with some really good DMs that just like, opened up that door even more where it's like no no tell me what you're going to do first and then we'll do the role because one like say you have a brilliant plan and you and you explain what you want to do some dms are like you have advantage because that if you're going to have your character do that like i think that's a very plausible situation or if you give a very poor or like oh they want to do this but they're really not sure then they might be like a regular or if it's just outrageous Maybe you'll get disadvantage. And so it just like there is that play in which um, if you did that role first, it may or may not necessarily really help with what you have going on up here. And so, um, yeah. That's really great. I, I think that's a really cool um, logical way to get people also thinking about the actual role playing. And man, I wish. <laughs> I wish that had been my my first experiences. I think that would have really helped me because I, I sometimes really struggle to think about really what would my character do. I'm always thinking about all this, you know, I do kind of get bogged down in the mechanics and like, what's on my character sheet? What are my options? Instead of just thinking about really what would my character do? So that's um, really, really cool. So how how does that differ if you're say say you have you know a home group or a group that you've been working with for a while if you want to introduce a new system do you do something different with your approach to introduce that versus how you do it with true novices um not not really Honestly, like the the process is pretty similar. Uh, you have the added benefit of them kind of knowing, like the concept of the hobby as a whole, and they're kind of they'll be more experienced with like trying to role play and with trying to like get into their character and things like that. But overall, I think it's still just as as limiting if you like focus too hard on specifically only mechanical options first. Like if you're learning a new system, like. Most of the time, you're playing that system because it's going to provide a different like setting or a different experience. You know, maybe if you've only been playing Dungeons and Dragons, maybe you'll play Star Wars because you want to play, you know, in a different in that universe. And like, if you like, if you drill too far into mechanics too early, again with that, it can still just kind of create weird situations. And like, you can go further with it because people are going to be more experienced. But I think the danger is still there of like locking in too soon while people are trying to figure out the system. That makes sense. Um, so what about like introducing the actual mechanics? So um, I, I noticed uh, here the last few days, uh, World of Darkness is getting really a lot of attention in the absolute tabletop group. And um, you know, a couple people are running games and uh, they talk, you know, they mentioned, oh, you know, core core rulebook, you know, character creation from the core, core rule, rulebook. And, you know, anytime a new system comes up, like the first, or something that's new to me comes up, the first thing I'm thinking is, wait, I don't have that core book. So 
like particularly if somebody hasn't made that investment in a book yet, how do you how do you um, approach like how do you introduce the character creation? How do you you know do you use pregens or do you do you have something else that you do to help them get through that character creation process and um, you know get them get them up and running for that first session? Yeah, so I don't often use pregens. Uh, every once in a while, I'll take a pregen if I'm playing in a game, particularly if it's like a one shot, like in short notice in a system that I don't know. Uh, more often than not, I guess I'll kind of take what would almost be like a middle ground between pregen and character concepts. So instead of just saying, like, here's a couple characters, pick one, I'll say, like, well, what kind of person do you want to play? Like, what type of character concept is interesting to you? What is there a particular part of the rules that you really want to explore? Um, and then if they say, oh, well, I, I think it'd be really fun to be this type of character or that type of character, then you can kind of guide the character creation specifically in that direction rather than having, like, the entirety of the book that they have to scan through and figure out all these different options. You can kind of say, okay, well, based on what you told me uh, about your concept for your character, it sounds like, like this character option would be would makes the most sense for you and maybe this one is a secondary option so you kind of narrow it down to maybe one or two and then they can kind of build their character out from there knowing that it's kind of directing them in the direction they already wanted to go um, and it kind of helps to smooth the process instead of just like here's a book of three thousand options pick them yeah that's Kind of my thing too, in the sense of I don't like playing pre gens necessarily, but um, if I do, being able to narrow it down, like working with the DM, like well, here's something that I would I enjoy playing, um, but because going through, I I'm just a one I'm a slow reader and two, and there's so many options, it just I I feel like I'm drowning in them, or it's like I don't know what to choose. There's uh, like, is this the one that I really want to stick with, or and so it just works better for me to have that being narrowed down, having someone who is better, uh, who might be better at just being able to retain so much more information, being able to direct me, and it's like, how about you start here? Yeah, I guess kind of like using 5e as an example, so like we're kind of talking about new systems, but like, so if somebody was going to play 5e for the first time, they'd only played like Fate or something. Like, I would ask, like, hey, what kind of character would you like to play? Do you want to play a spellcaster? Do you want to play a warrior? Uh, do you want to play, like, a healer cleric? If they said, oh, well, I really want to play a spellcaster. And it's like, okay, like, go through your player's handbook, or I'll go through it if you don't have one. But only look at, like, wizard, sorcerer, and warlock. Pick one of those three. Don't worry about bard. Don't worry about ranger. Like, we'll get to those, because those are not the type of character that you talked about. And then kind of use that as a jumping off point. So that way they only have to work through maybe one or two things instead of like a million things. That's pretty great. I, I know when I did, uh, when I played Shadowrun with um, Thomas Stansfield of um, something about tabletop, he, he kind of took that approach and then he had pregens that were set up for that, which if anybody has ever tried Shadowrun, it's, it's pretty, I don't know how, I still, I've played it maybe three sessions of it and I still have like no idea how I would ever, you know, I'm just not ready to create a character. Um, and so that worked really well, but he, he did that. And then he said, oh, well, I have this character, this character, and this character, you can take a look at them and pick. And so for that game, it worked really well and then because he knew the characters, he was able to really, really assist a lot in, in the you know, game. Um, it, he was able to say, this is how many dice you're gonna roll. I'm gonna have you roll this and this is how many it is and kind of help me find my way. Um, similarly, um, when I played Justin Files with John Peter Drury, uh, for, that was that was for Brigade Con one year. He also had pre-gens, and he kind of did the same thing. Like, what kind of character are you interested in playing? And then I picked that character. Conversely, when I did um, 
a workshop with scouts. Uh, we we use Gary Asselford's um, Dungeon Scouts materials, and he had pre-gens that were kind of, you know, he stuck to the basics, the basic characters. And I mean, you're talking about having an entire table of brand new people versus having, I don't think any of us had even one person who had played before and there were three of us running um, scenarios or encounters. Um, but he left things, he left the, uh, for instance, the wizard character, you know, he left their name blank so that they could name the character. And then he had um, things where he still let them assign stuff. Like you still, here's, here's your um, standard array. You get to assign that and decide how you want your character to go. And then he had, you know, some spells that you could choose from, but he had kind of a limited choice of spells. So you could sit down with these character sheets and somebody says, I really want to play a wizard. You hand them the wizard and they did the rest from there. And then it was set up so that they could pick their, their race and stuff and customize it. And I thought that was a really nice compromise between a flat out pre-gen um, that you might get, uh, you know, from a, a box set or something versus creating your character. It still gave them enough character creation to really buy into their character, but it also um, gave them the ability to make choices. And we ended up, my table ended up with, I don't know, three or four wizards out of six girls. So it was kind of interesting and fun, but that's what they wanted and that was okay. So. I think on the opposite side then, I have a different experience with a lot of my new players. <clears throat> three of my new players that I have in a game they actually want to go the other route and they just said give me the book and they just wanted to read through it and then they found their characters that way so while Kenzie was making her which is my uh, dolphin mom that I play with uh, her character she would constantly call me as I was driving away because she kept on telling me about all these exciting things she figured out about her character that she could do and all the exciting spells that she actually couldn't have so I had to go back and help fix with her but it was a really good learning experience because now she knows her character inside and out because she didn't have somebody walk it through she learned everything by herself which is also a different way of doing it, but it takes a certain personality to be able to do that. I think that actually brings up another question because I know that you are running a full-on campaign with those folks, and you started us out right away with a campaign too. Um, how do you guys feel about that Like, as a new player or as a GM with new players? Do you think starting out with a campaign right off the bat is the way to go? Or do you think, you know, shorter session, you know, maybe a mini campaign or a one shot or something is better for introducing? Do you have a preference? <laughs> well, my, uh, my gaming is a lot like my love life. <laughs> I'm more committed. So I don't like doing one shots and then just leaving it. But what I do do is, well, you know what I've done but I'll explain to everybody else. Uh, Miriam can attest that I first introduce people into the game and I basically test them and I throw them into a one shot and see how they like it. I'm like, hey, would you be interested in continuing like the first date and then they can either decide from there or not. So with my other family, I knew from the very beginning that everyone wanted to play because everyone always asked to and I was always like, eh, I don't know. I don't know if this is the type of way we could do it. Now that we have D&D, &D, a, a tool that I can use to kind of help keep everyone together, I knew instantly everybody would be interested in a very long campaign. But before we, I even did this campaign, to be honest, I ran a short evil campaign just for fun. And that was more or less a break for me and to see how they did. So that kind of answers it. Yeah, I, I, so I come kind of from a little bit of a different perspective. All of my gaming is all online. I have no home group. So basically any game that I run, I'm gathering players from groups like Absolute Tabletop um, for those games. Um, and kind of coming in from that angle, I, I would never, ever run a campaign for a new person that I didn't know. Um, just as a matter of, there's, there's a lot of commitment that kind of goes into preparing a campaign and running a campaign. And it'd be a shame to basically put in like hours and hours of work, like making like a world and all these characters and all these connections. And then somebody either like doesn't even show up for the first session or they show up and they they play and they're like, eh, I don't, this isn't really for me. And then it's just, so 
for me, because these people aren't like my friends, I don't necessarily know them. They're not people that I've worked with or talked with. Um, basically always a one shot. It's just so much easier to create like a, a focused experience that'll kind of give them a test drive. Uh, and if they like me as a person, if they like the game as an, as an idea, then they can pursue that further, get into another couple one shots, and then maybe into campaigns uh, as they come up in the group. Uh, but that's kind of from the pure online perspective. And I totally agree with that and whatnot. Um, although, like, for me, my experience was boom, right into a campaign. But I think why that worked so well is because I was in a home group. I was playing with people that we knew each other. We were friends. Um, and then when that kind of dissolved and my addiction was set, I started looking online and came across uh, uh, first Roll20 in which I jumped into a game. And yeah, like, th though to say that campaign that I joined on Roll20 uh, lasted about a year, but all along the way, uh, one player at a time was dropped being out and we had like it was down to four of us plus one of the others able to talk their friend into joining as well um and we were able to make it about another four months for a big explosion everyone was done it was like okay then i found facebook and uh kind of a similar thing where I hopped into a campaign because like, hey, I'm I'm all about playing a story and I love it. Uh, and knowing my personality, I'm like, yeah, I'll be there because I don't get in fights with people. <laughs> and so, um, but yeah, same kind of thing where uh, it just, these people coming together, this is actually where Chrissy and I met was in this campaign, but uh, people start falling apart and whatnot, or like, I can't make it, or I don't get along with this person, and it's like, okay, and then it's like, well, let's do these one-shots, and, like, I gotta say, one-shots are wonderful in the sense of low commitment, you're able to get in there, have a quick, like, play with some new people and kind of get to know like oh i get along famously with that person and this person has a really cool way of role playing and and i love how this dm approaches the game and then before you like before i knew it after doing that for about three four months i had like five campaigns i was in i was like i'm done with one shots now and i have no time as i'm playing all these games and like those ones were more successful um because the group was made up of people that are like oh yeah we've gamed before and we do well yeah yeah i think you know i think too when you're playing in person you have that opportunity you even if you're the only one with books you can sit down with those people you can do a session zero or whatever it takes do a big character creation thing help it help everybody and have that dynamic and chances are if you have a well i guess it depends on where your group came from but i know for nate and i our in-person groups are are people that we're already friends with and or family with. So it's really easy. You already know you get along. So you don't have that hurdle. I suppose if you went to a game shop and you wanted to get into a game or something, that would be another whole animal. Um, but yeah, for online, I you know, I have to agree with, um, with Mary and Jeff, like those one shots are really valuable because it really gives you a chance to figure out who you click with and how it works. Um, I do find when it comes to campaigns online, it's, gosh, it's so darn hard to get, even with committed players, even with people you know get along with, it's so hard to to keep it on a regular schedule and, like, stick with it. There's always, you know, five or six people or four, four or five or however many you play with, there's always something coming up for someone. And uh, so that part's a little a little tough, but... Um, yeah, I think chemistry wise, I think one shots or mini, you know, triple shot or, you know, shorter sessions are a great way to jump in and see if it's a fit. Yeah. And like what you say about campaigns online is like exactly right. Like there's just so many factors that all have to like line up for an online campaign to be successful long term. Like everybody's schedule has to work. Like everybody's play style has to be similar. The concept of the game has to be interesting to everybody and stay interesting to everybody. There's like 10 things 
that if they're not all exactly right, like the campaign's going to fall apart. And even and then, even if all of those things are right, someone could still like, oh, well, suddenly my work schedule changed. I can't make the game anymore. And like, there's just a million things. Like even with yeah, dedicated that, committed that. players, like it can be difficult to keep even them. So like trying to do that with people that you don't know and with people who are new is going to be like nearly impossible, in my, at least in my experience. Yeah, that um, definitely creates a big challenge. Um, although I, I must say I do like those posts that when they put everything out on the board, like here's the DM, this is what I am wanting to run, this is what I'm kind of looking for in the time slot, and those who are like, oh, I could make that, awesome. Um, I've had a game where person was like, hey, I want to run a game with all of you. And it's like, cool, what day? Oh my word. It was like, yeah, that just doesn't work. Like, I'm glad you want to play with all of us, but we are all on very different schedules and you're better off just putting up a, hey, uh, here's what I want to run on this day at this time tag people maybe that you're hoping will see it first and and kind of uh, they get first dibs in a way maybe um but yeah it's just uh i think those posts that put that out kind of helps but yeah life happens you, you never know what's going to happen two three months for a person like i'm pretty overconfident of oh my life my schedule's going to stay exactly the same and whatnot and you know like my job is reliant on the people i work for and they keeping their jobs and so it's just you don't know what's going to happen so true yeah, so true <laughs> Especially online with, with time zones, I mean, like, it's so important to put the time ahead of time of, like, I'm going to run this game on Saturday, November 4th at 6 p.m. That's when it's going to happen. If you cannot do that, then, like, don't sign up. Yeah, that, be there or be square. <laughs> yeah, some of the people in the group, you know, may not even be on the, on the same continent as you. So, like, <laughs> trying to, like, organize, like, if you just pick random people who you think are, like, going to be cool to play with, you know, maybe one of them's going to be in... England, maybe one of them's going to be in Australia, the other one's on the East Coast, the other one's on the West Coast, and it's like, it's going to be tough to make that happen. Like, so you, if, but if you go in and say, this is going to happen at this time, this day, like, you cut that factor out ahead of time. Like, it's, it's really important for online gaming to do that. Yeah, I agree. And even, even for um, home games, if you, if you can have a schedule, it really helps. It's so much more helpful. Um, I know my home group has, we've had, we have too many people doing, involved in too many things, and we've had a really, really difficult time this past year in particular trying to get together on any kind of a regular basis. We're lucky if we get together once a month. Um, but when you can say, oh, it's always going to be the, you know, third Saturday of the month or whatever, then at least as you're looking at your calendar, you can, you know, you can schedule around that and say, hey, you know, something comes up. I'm not free that day. I'm gaming. But that it makes it tough if uh, if everything's always just kind of TBD. <laughs> so um, what about any any other any uh, like tips or tricks or tools that you find are especially helpful with um, with new players? You do. <laughs> we have a I'm in a lot of groups and there's a lot of new players that keep coming by so I've actually have like a little clipboard list where I just shoot them little things first thing that explains what DND is another one that shows different types of DMs and then one that's a, a DMing like a campaign that's on the internet so they can kind of watch and see how different people role play and how games go because you have all these people are always asking like oh can you explain this to me and it's like well really there's not enough time in the day to explain everything about D&D but I can give you videos that show everything and then you can pick up which part you like that'd be my tip so I know when I worked with the with the kids with the girl scouts um, one of the things I I just said to him is like here's your d20 know your d20 love your d20 <laughs> Anytime I ask you to do a perception check, a, a uh, you know, a stealth roll, any any of these things, you're going to be rolling that d20. So get to know it. Just know it's the thing you're going to roll the most, and and I'll help you with the rest. 
<laughs> develop a relationship with it because it'll it, it is the deciding factor whether you live or die. <laughs> so true. Oh, for new players who might be watching this and debating whether they should do it, just do it. That's my advice. Do it. Have fun with it. Yeah. So, like, my tip for like put your friends to it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my 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 tip for new players to the game, like completely new to the hobby, is always pretty much something along these lines. Like, this is not a video game. This is not a board game. Your options are not limited. You can do whatever you want. You can go wherever you want. Now, those actions may have consequences. You know, if you if you mouth off to the king, you know, maybe he's not going to like that. If you attack this person, you know, maybe they'll kill you. But all those options are on the table. Like, st stop looking at, like, what you should do or what, your op what mechanical options you might have or, like, what the story is telling you you should do and think about what your character would do and how they would react to these other people and how they would react in the world. Um, and like try to free yourself from that video game board game mentality of like what are my options your options are whatever you want them to be that's awesome advice <laughs> that's really good um nate i know you like to use dnd &D beyond have you found um there's something particularly useful about that as far as having newer players or you just the whole like character it. creation process has just made everything but uh just use orc pup honestly um, that way it's a pain anything for new players i totally recommend that and then if you feel like you actually want to put the money into it then i strongly recommend D, &D beyond because not only does it give the creators of D, &D money which is more incentive to actually build more um it's also just a great system. And I noticed with Orc Pub, there still seems to be uh, ads that you get on the actual page, I think, when you're actually doing this stuff. With D&D Beyond, if you're not paying with a subscription, which is pretty cheap, uh, anyways, I think it's like $3 a month, which is honestly just lunch, so whatever. But um, on the actual page itself, where you have your character sheet, they disabled all ads, which is amazing. So the only time you have ads is when you're looking up something really random and uh, vacuous. But uh, Says that, yeah, no, D&D &D Beyond has made the whole character creation process and the rules and dual classing and features has made it all super simplified, which I adore. Cool. Um, so I want to visit, revisit pregens a little bit, although I'm not sure we're going to get far with it because it sounds like most of us don't use them. Uh, but, you know, I was kind of curious um about how people go about create if you're creating them as opposed to pulling them out of a box set um how do you how do you approach that do you do you create a set of um pregens with a certain balance in mind um like you know at 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 atcon um i played in matt's uh, harbinger game and I think I was the only one who hadn't messed with the playtest materials. So um, I might have been the only one who ended up using a pregen, but, but you know, Matt had several there. And it made me, you know, it's one of the things that I've thought about looking at um, potentially running Deadlands, if I can ever wrap my head around it, is, you know, having pregens so that people don't have to buy the, um, the materials and especially because I got the anniversary edition so it's the older version it's not the currently available version so if you are creating pregens what are there some tips for like how to do that to um, you know do you worry about balancing the party do you are there things you you know you take into consideration so I don't I don't create a lot of pregens uh, there are a couple things that I would do um, if I did so the first one is I, I wouldn't worry about balance. I would worry about what the people want to play. Um, so if somebody wants to play a certain type of character, I would make them that type of character. And if you end up with four wizards in your party because everybody that's what's interesting to everybody, then I would just do that. Um, I think game balance and party balance is kind of overrated as a concept in general. Um, so 
uh, that with pregens, it's not really on my mind. Uh, the one thing that I definitely would do, um, and I would do this with new players, even if they were making their own characters, tie the characters to each other and to the world, particularly to each other. Um, I think one of the easiest ways for a new player to get burnt off of a system is to have antagonistic party members. Uh, you know, if you have the rogue, who all, all the rogue does is the, uh, try to pocket the gold off of the monsters before they get to them and like subvert their, mo their every move and try to sneak off and do their own thing. And it's like, if you have a character who's like directly like opposing the rest of the party members, it can like very easily become incredibly frustrating, especially for a new person who might not know how to navigate that, and what their options are and what they should or shouldn't do. Totally agree. Like, that was my first campaign experience. Yeah, like make the characters matter to each other and make them not want to hurt each other. Even if they, if they don't have to be good heroes, but they should care about each other. And they should like, have something that ties them into what's happening in the world so they have a reason to participate in the adventure. So actually with that, with that comment, that makes me wonder too, do you, do you tell, do you have this, sorry, do you say to people, this is a team cooperative experience. This is not, this is not, uh, you know, I know you, you specifically Jeff mentioned that you explained that it's not a board game and it's not a video game. So hopefully that kind of gets that concept in mind of this isn't a game that we win. This is, you know, hopefully something we succeed in whatever we set out to do, but it is a cooperative game. And I, I know we've run into it with Nate's game where I know we've had at least one player that maybe didn't get that we're supposed to be doing things as a group and that it, it's not the idea that you go off on your own. So do you, do, is there a conversation that you have with people about that specifically? Um, it's not necessarily like a totally overt conversation, um, though sometimes it is. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a GM who likes party conflict in general. Like I, I think it's interesting and like it, it provides like good role playing challenges, but for new players, like it's tough to know like the level of nuance that you need to like navigate. Um, and it's very easy for like party conflicts to just like radically escalate uh, needlessly. Um, so one person will do like something small and then suddenly, you know, next thing you know, there's swords drawn and, and, and blows being struck. It's like, so, for the first session or so, I, I definitely try to emphasize, like, you guys are a team. You're working as a team towards the same goal. You do not want to hurt each other. You know, as they get better and better as players, you know, then they, you can navigate some of the more subtle party conflicts um, as they kind of get better role-playing chops. But right off the bat, yeah, it's definitely easier to say, like, you guys are all on a team. Don't go out of your way to hurt each other. Like, just don't do it. Nice. Any other tips and tricks we can think of for t teaching people games or introducing new games, new systems to your existing group or anything else we want to add today? I haven't seen any questions in the chat, so. Oh, but Devane Fuego, who I didn't, I'm so sorry, Devane, I owe you a huge apology. He was supposed to be on this panel. And um, I think I thought that I had lost just about everyone who had signed up. And so he never got the link. So, so sorry. But um, he says, balance be damned. Personal ties are where the real magic is. So <laughs> that's sorry. true. Yeah, that is true. Um, as far as new tips or extra tips for new time players, just don't go overwhelmed. Don't overthink it. Go with the flow. You know, you're not going to be the best rp -er on your first time so just kind of sit back relax watch have a few laughs and then as soon as you start getting more comfortable then it's more appropriate to start doing some of the other things that you want and some people never even come to become an rp -er. some people just enjoy sitting in the back watching and being part of the story and some just enjoy the family time and there's no wrong or right way to play dungeons and dragons or any rp game for that matter it's just about having a good time and so that's definitely why i don't want to throw out there for people. Yeah, that's actually a, a really, really good point. Um, like, I think it's very easy for like players new to the game to think like the way that they play the game the first time is the way that the game 
just is. No. Like, like, yeah, like Dungeons and Dragons and tabletop RPGs in general are not just one thing. There's not just one way. Like there's as many ways to play as there are groups who play. And like everyone's approach is going to be different. You know, some people is just going to be hanging out, rolling some dice, telling jokes in the meantime, telling stories, catching up with each other, you know. Some games it's going to be like super serious and there's going to be like heavy RP and like emotional pulls and, and like really in depth. And it's like all of those ways are fine. So like find your style, find what you like and like move in that direction. If you like super serious RP moments, then work towards that or find a group that's going to help you with that. If you just want to hang out and roll some dice and, and chill, then find a group who wants to do that. Like there's a, a group and a style for everybody out there. Um, it may take a little bit to find it, but if you do, it'll be worth it. That's true. Absolutely, yeah. That's that's great. Oh, um, and buy ahead. the buy the player's handbook. For, if you're gonna get actually into it, just for everyone's sake, just buy buy the book. It's not that expensive. <laughs> it's only one book too. Yeah, I I like to, and I'd say that for any system. Once you know for sure you want to play it, I did recently um, buy Edge of the Empire, but I don't think I'll ever. But enough that I know I'm going to want to play it more. So it was worth it just for the character creation alone to go ahead and and um, and jump in and buy it. So I think it's worth it for any game once you know you like it. And I would say on the player end of it, don't be afraid to ask the GM. Um, most of the GMs in the absolute absolute tabletop group for sure probably the uh, power up gamers group as well and i'm not sure how many games get posted through the rpg brigade but i feel like most of the gms in the online community are pretty open to um running with for new players and it's perfectly okay to say i knew i don't have the book you know are you okay with that can you assist me and a lot of times too even the other players in the group will be willing to help you and um, so don't be afraid don't be afraid to ask and don't don't let that be the thing that holds you back from trying out a new game or a new system yeah I mean with how much there's a lot of free material too out there so you can definitely get all the information you need I know Wizards of Coast also have a free version a PDF of the book that gives you all the basic rules so if you're just looking to jump in and you don't even need to buy dice because you can just do something like this hey Google roll 1d20 <laughs> and I've found that there's a lot of um, <laughs> Quick start, free quick starts uh, for a lot of games too, and so as you're exploring other systems, it's always worth doing a quick look. Or sometimes you can get the uh, pay what you want on Drive Through RPG for something, and you can get you know the pared down version um, to try it out. Um, cool. Yeah, most, well, most systems will have some way of getting into it. Like it's it's pretty rare that like an established system will have like absolutely nothing outside of like buying the book. There's usually some kind of connection. A basic rule set, like I know D and D has a basic rules. They'll have like a couple races and a couple classes, and then maybe like one archetype and so on. Uh, and most systems will have something like that. Um, at the very least, uh, like you say, like especially if it's a system that's not D and D, most DMs who run those systems, you know, have a hard time getting players who are interested in things other than D&D &D anyways. So it's like mm -hmm. having somebody be like, hey, I'd love to play Star Wars, but I don't know how. They'll be like, oh, heck yeah, I'll definitely teach you. Definitely. So yeah, just don't be afraid to ask. <laughs> definitely. OK, well, I think that wraps up our first ever panel. So thank you so much, Jeff, for joining us. And thank you, Mary. She had to pop off a little early because she had someplace else she had to be. But um, thank you so much for those who tuned in to watch. And thanks for taking time out on your Saturday morning, too, um, or maybe afternoon, depending on where people are, to, uh, to join us. So thank you so much. And um, we hope you get out there and try, try something new. <laughs> <Okay>. Bye, guys. <laughs> Bye.